We are here at the opening of the project Ukraine is You, a project organized by the Viktor Pinchuk Foundation, the Pinchuk Art Center, together with the Office of the President of Ukraine. Today's project has three different components. One component are a series of lectures and conversations that will happen throughout the coming days. We have two exhibitions, one exhibition on liberation, specifically the liberation of Kherson here on the ground floor, and a second exhibition on war crimes, continuing what we have done in May here in Davos, um, which you can find on the first floor. Now let me please welcome the founder of the Pinchuk Art Center, the Viktor Pinchuk Foundation, Yes and East One Group, Viktor Pinchuk. Yeah, thank you. Uh, dear friends, Mr. President, Mr. Minister, uh, welcome to our project, Ukraine is You. What happened in Ukraine can happen to you. Uh, that's why we invite you to be Ukrainian for the moment here. Join Ukrainians in the moment of liberation, in the moment of uh, 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 empowerment, bringing freedom back, moment liberation of Kherson, for example. But also join Ukrainian in the moment of suffering because it's happening every day and every hour. You know, three days ago, I was in the process of preparation, in the process of preparation to my trip to Davos and I heard one news one more missile attack to Ukraine, and it happened. This is my hometown, Dnipro. And I know this building very well, and I know my friend there. By the way, my oldest daughter now, she's also in Dnipro, and she told me, Father, I heard this. And many people died during this attack. More than 40 bodies already found it, but expectation it will be more. It's terrible, and it reminds me one more time how terrible this war is. And just, uh, you know, please, for the moment, imagine. You sit in your living room or in your kitchen, and then a missile comes. And, and can you please imagine it with me? for a second or for millisecond. This is what happened, and this is what happens all the time. If it's not stopped, and now I will tell you two things. First, the missile that killed these people could not be stopped by Ukraine because we don't have weapon to stop this missile. This missile, H-22, also, military specialists call this uh, killer of air carrier, carrier. This is really very powerful missile. Russian terrorists uh, already sent more than 200 missiles of this type, and even no one was stopped because we don't have defense. But it exists, and you have this. For example, Patriots, please send this equipment to Ukraine now, because please imagine Imagine Ukrainians in this moment of tragedy, and maybe it will help you to make this decision faster. And also, uh, second thing, this attack uh, also one more proof how Ukrainians are unbrokeable. I just spoke with the mayor of Dnipro, and he told me, you know, immediately after this attack, we offered to all people, and this building has more than thousands of residents, we offered to all residents per, um, temporary apartments and, of course, food. And everybody said no, because already their friends, volunteers, relatives offered to them everything. Only what they needed, but uh, it was closest because they lost everything. But uh, uh, people from Dnipro sent much more even closer than even they needed. It shows how strong Ukrainian people, 
their strength and the unity of the nations. But still, we need our very strong and very immediate help. Uh, what interesting fact, the name of this residential uh, district where this building exists, the name, Pobeda, it means victory. And it's very symbolic because it means that the resident of this building will never give up and the residents of Dnipropetrovsk will never give up and these kids from Kherson will never give up and their parents will never give up and all the Ukrainians will never give up. On the only question, how many Ukrainians must die before our enemy will understand, will accept their defeat. And uh, I have to tell you that this war has many fronts. Of course, the main front is military front, military front where, where our heroes risk their lives and fight. But cultural front is also very important. And uh, I believe that art is, has potential to be very efficient, not only to very efficient weapon, Maybe it will help to convince decision makers to send necessary weapon much quicker. And I believe this exhibition will contribute to our, hist to our victory. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Pinchuk. And now it's my honor to introduce the president of Poland, President Duda. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with you and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, this is a very important moment and a very important place. Second time, unfortunately, this, this special Ukrainian house here in Davos presenting Russian war crimes is being opened here and and thank you very much because this is very 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 important to show all participants of this world economic forum this conference people who are coming here from all over the world to present to present them, to show them the truth about Russian invasion against Ukraine, about Russians' behaviors in Ukraine during that invasion, during that terrible war. I'm also very happy that one of the co-organizers, one of the participants of organization this house is former Polish president, Mr. Alexander Kwasniewski. Mr. President, thank you very much because your presence here and, and your participation in this in this very important in this very important uh, issue is 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 one of the evidence of our friendship and and our good neighborhood. Please let me speak in my mother tongue, in Polish. Uh, Dear friends, thank you very much once again for having me. Very often when I talk to President Volodymyr Zelensky, he speaks in Ukrainian and I speak Polish and we understand each other. have to decide where should go Ruski Vajenny Karabli. Ale poważnie mówiąc, a sytuacja jest poważna. But speaking seriously, and the situation is serious. Ladies and gentlemen, very frequently we say that. 
people responsible for Russian crimes uh, in Ukraine, for Russian war crimes, for everything that is taking place on Ukrainian soil today, in Ukrainian villages, for what happened in Bucha and in other places. Uh, they have to be they have to be accountable um, before courts, and this criminal accountability has to be realized. Thank you for this house, for this exhibition, for this presentation, especially because the world needs to know why this responsibility is there and why we demand this responsibility, this accountability. That is why the presentation of the evidence of Russian crimes here is so important. And I hope that all the participants of the Davos Forum will come here. I hope that every one of them will visit this place. Even if uh, they are sensitive, and especially if they are sensitive, they should come here and they should see it with their own eyes so that they know why Russian criminals are prosecuted. They are prosecuted for a very simple reason, just as until this day the Nazi criminals of the Second World War are being prosecuted, just like until today criminals responsible for crimes in the states of the former Yugoslavia are being prosecuted during the war, just as until today war criminals are being prosecuted in many other places, they have been held accountable and also exactly in this place, in this case, this accountability has to uh, come to fruition so that everyone who even thinks for a moment that war crimes could be committed knows that they will be held accountable and they must have full awareness of that. And that is why this accountability has to be executed. And in order to make it happen, the world has to see it. Very often the world does not want to see it. And you know that very well. The world turns its head, turns its eyes away. That is why one has to show it in a very decisive way. Therefore, I thank you so much as your neighbor, as the neighbor of Ukraine, as the one who visited Borodyanka, the one who saw Irpin right after Russians were forced out of the place, the one who saw what this war means. This war doesn't differ anyway from the Second World War in any way. It is not a subtle war, a delicate war of the 21st century, or a war on TV screens. No, this is a brutal war, a horrible war. During which people lose their lives, they lose their livelihoods, they lose hope, which has to be stopped. Russians have to be stopped. This war can end in only one way, uh, through the defeat of Russians, through forcing them out of Ukraine. We have to make sure that it happens. We have to do everything in our power. And those who perpetrate war crimes have to be punished. And especially in that context, let me thank you for this place. And especially in that context, thank you for having me as President of the Republic of Poland, as representative of your neighbors, but also as representative of your friends, a point I want to stress very strongly. Thank you for having me here, because I also demand that accountability to take place. I'm here also because today I am, in a sense, a host in a country in which women and children of the defenders of Ukraine are taking shelter. This is a point I often make. Please fight at peace. Please fight with a peace of your mind. Be calm. Women, children, your children, your mothers, your sisters, who have come to our country, who have taken refuge in Poland, are safe, and we, on our side, We'll do everything in our power to make sure that they feel as good as it gets and that they can safely and soundly come back home when you have pushed out the aggressors, when you have won. And to the women and children in Poland, I say, do not worry. We shall rebuild Ukraine, and it will be more beautiful than it was before. But 
in order for that to happen and in order to sit down together at the same table afterwards, drying your eyes from tears, uh, commemorating the fallen ones, and after everything, all the experiences of those who will have survived, in order to do it with peace and calm, uh, criminals have to be punished, and all of you know that perfectly well. Also, so that all of us uh, have can sleep peacefully for the future, so that in front of the future generations, we can say we have done everything in our power to uh, make sure that such bestiality never happens again. And in, that is even more important in this place. A young man from Kherson who would like to hand you over a small gift. Yes, Kherson, Thank you very much for the assistance you've provided to Kherson, for the moral support for the products, for the, for the food, for the humanitarian assistance. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for supporting us in, in these difficult times. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Ukraine hasn't died yet. It's my honor to introduce the head of the office of the President of Ukraine, Mr. Yermak, who is joining us online. Mr. Yermak, I think we can see you here. Can you hear and see us? The floor is yours. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm glad to greet our foreign guests, Presidents of Poland, Mr. Andrzej Duda, and Mr. Pekka Havisto, Minister of the Foreign Affairs of the Finland. And I'd like to thank Mr. Pinchuk for organizing this very important event and having us here. Last weekend, Russia launched another massive air raid on Ukraine and one of the missiles hit on the ordinary residential building. Again, this time it was in Dnipro, an entire section with dozens of apartments was completely destroyed. 41 leaves were lost in the moment, and several dozens of wounded are struggling to survive. Ukrainians have been living through the horror of the 11 months in a row. And it is no wonder we are incredibly eager to win. After all, no normal person in the EVE would want a missile to hit their home. But no victory is complete without restoration of justice. Which means the guilty must be punished and the damages we have caused must be compensated. The crime repetition must be prevented. What's what the Ukrainian peace formula President Zelensky presented provides for? In our case, justice is reached through trial of wars who committed war crimes. We've registered 80,000 crimes committed by the Russian invaders. Over 9,000 civilians have been killed, including 453 children. And these are the facts established so far. Alas, the tragedy scale is much greater. For nearly every liberated town or village, we find evidence of torture and extrajudicial executions. And also people murdered by thousands, hundreds of destroyed settlements and demolished infrastructural ob objects. Numerous international decisions and resolutions mention them. <coughs> we will forgive not a single torture or life taken, not a single destroyed home, not a single tear of Ukrainian child. Each criminal will be held accountable. With General Prosecutor Office of Ukraine, our law enforcement agency and the International Criminal Court are working on it. But we raise several types of calypteries of our case. The first is one who committed a war crime. A Russian soldier who came to kill all Ukrainian soul or miss missile operator who sent death to the peaceful city. And there is a, the second type 
was people in power who have enabled or know this terror, with top officials who have committed the, pre the primary crime of aggression, the war angering leaders, we have answers. We know how to bring to justice both direct perpetrators and those who embellished the aggression, who restore international order and exchangeable respect for international law. We need your help. From the darkness with dying empire is dragging the world together. We can get it back to the light. We are making history together. And it depends on your combined efforts, how hard and how quickly we can crack down on these and humans committing the immense atrocities in the 21st century. Russia has already been recognized an aggressor state by United Nations General Assembly. But to punish the Russian top political leaders for the crime of aggression, we need a special international tribunal. For the International Criminal Court does not have inappropriate jurisdictions. And Ukraine, together with the partner states, is doing everything possible to create the special tribunal. Another option is for United Nations Security Council to qualify Russian's actions as an act of aggressions and refer the matters to International Criminal Court. But Russia still has the veto rights in the Security Council. It is high time to deprive the terrorist states of any rights in the United Nations because it has repeatedly violated all the international community rules. The special tribunal would be able to progress much faster than international criminal court can investigate crimes related to mass atrocities. In defining specific individuals guilty of war crimes and crimes against humanity, especially at the political leadership level, is a difficult task. Meanwhile, we special tribunal might issue the indictment in about two or two, uh, two, three months. After all, it is relatively easier to prove the fact of the crime of aggressions on the part of Russia. It has already been recognized in the United Nations General Assembly resolution and other international bodies. It is extremely important step for Ukraine and the democratic world. PSE, the European Parliament, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, the same as Lithuania, the Parliament of Estonia, the Netherlands, the Czech Republic, and Latvia support this initiative. Similar decisions are being made in the United States and the Germany. The European Council has started working on the mechanism to establish the tribunal. But now, more than ever, we need deconsolidated international support for adoption of the United Nations General Assembly resolution to establish the tribunal. We ask all civilized states to join these initiatives. An equally important issue is compensation for the damage the Russian troops caused to Ukrainians. So far, Russia has destroyed 54,000 residential buildings, over 2,000 educational institutions, 480 hospitals, 316 culture monuments, 88 churches, and nearly 4,000 livelihood infrastructure networks, not to mention thousands of industrial enterprises, warehouse, gas stations, shopping malls, and other assets. Every minute, the list of is getting longer. The United Nations General Assembly has already agreed on the concept of the compensation mechanism. It provides for the creation of the International Registry of Losses, an international compensation commission, and the compensation fund to be financed primarily the Russian assets, including gold and currency reserves. 
we call on our partners to adopt changes to the national legislations to confiscate assets and transfer them to the compensation fund. It is also extremely important that the G7 countries join the international agreements of creating the registry of the damages and the compensation commission, which Ukraine will propose jointly with the Netherlands. We call all civilized nations to stand up for justice. Once again, two things are necessary. The special international tribunal and the legislation to compensate for the damages the Russian aggressions caused. Liberty is impossible without strong justice. Let's make it work. Lest one dictator or another tries to repeat inviting sovereign states. United and strong, we can stop them. Thank you very much. Slava Ukraini. Thank you very much, Mr. Yermak. Thank you for being with us. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Finland, Minister Havisto. President Duda, dear hosts, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure and honor to be here today in the Ukraine House and, and in this inauguration of the important exhibition. I had an opportunity to be here last May when meeting a group of Ukrainian parliamentarians actually showing how well the democracy works in Ukraine and what kind of debate you have in Ukraine also in the middle of the war and in the middle of the Russian uh, aggression. I had an opportunity to visit Ukraine and Kiev in December with my Baltic and Nordic colleagues, a group of seven ministers all together. We met with President Zelensky. We learned actually that President Zelensky admires very much General Mannerheim and the Finnish Winter War, our resistance against Russia. And we had to say that we admire the Ukrainians at this moment. We know what this fight is about. It's about the democracy, it's about the human rights, it's about the respect of your borders, and you are on the right side of the history, all of you Ukrainians. We are also condemning all the war crimes that are happening. We have very recently seen the very cruel attacks against the civilian population, against the houses, against the civilian infrastructure, against the electricity networks, against the gas pipelines and, and so forth. Uh, it's a cop those are covertly acts by Russia. All of this has to be investigated. The war crimes have to be clarified. There has to be accountability on what's happening currently on the front. And we are sure that Ukraine will win this war. But Ukraine, we know, will not win this war alone. You need support, and we try to mobilize that support. From the Finnish side, we are preparing the 12th military package for Ukraine. And we are currently, of course, in intensive discussions what more we can do as European Union, as Nordic countries, to help Ukraine at this moment. I know that the discussion is ongoing about the Leopard tanks and so forth. We hope that this decision will be made real and Finland definitely is ready to take its part in that support. One element that has not been so often raised about this crisis is all the damage that this is doing to the environment. We know that when people are dying, it feels sometimes trivial to speak about the environment, but this Davos meeting is also about the climate change, this is also about the biodiversity loss, this is about the nuclear safety, and all these issues are happening also currently in Ukraine. Just before leaving for Davos, I discussed with Mr. Grossi from IAEA. He was on his way to Ukraine to look at the situation of the nuclear safety. And we all know what kind of risks this can bring to the situation if any damage to nuclear power plants in additional damage will, will happen. I think also for that reason, we have to concentrate on Ukraine. We have to concentrate that this war comes to the end. We have to concentrate that President Zelensky's 10 point peace plan will be implemented and we have to concentrate that all support from the European Union and from the United Nations will be mobilized towards Ukraine. Thank you for your fight. Thank you, Minister. Now, from Ukraine, the Mayor of Militopol, Mayor Fedorov. 
Mr. President, dear colleague, for me it's a great opportunity to present citizens from temporarily occupied territories here. The war in my country continues for 11 months. It is the war that Russia started on our land and all this time all world is uh, watching a bloody crimes against humanity, rights and freedom and of course European values. I experienced what human rights mean under Putin regime. After the occupation of my native city Melitopol by Russian troops, I was taken hostages by Russians only because I refused to betray Ukraine. And our people, our citizens, refused to remove Ukrainian flag from central square of the Melitopol. Thanks to the efforts of the President of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, I was released from captivity. However, hundreds of citizens of Melitopol, however, a thousand of citizens on temporarily occupied territories, they are now on the prisons and on the torture camps. The face of many of them is unknown. The resistance in Melitopol and Mariupol and other cities of the south coast of the Azov Sea saved Zaporizhia and other cities in the south of Ukraine from the enemy. Despite the terror, the almost 11 months of living under occupation, the resistance of Melitopol haven't lost hope and liberation of the city. Today, about 50,000, 60,000 resistance remain in the city and they all become hostages of the Putin's regime. After our life in the occupied has turned into a prison. For a month, occupiers do not release people from the temporarily occupied territories to the territory controlled by Ukraine. Not anyone humanitarian or evacuation way. So today, Melitopol is the largest prison in Europe. It is almost impossible to leave it. And there are other occupied cities and towns that enemy also turned into prison and torture chambers. Today, a real genocide is taking place in the temporarily occupied territories, and it is aimed at the destruction of the Ukrainian identity. Residents of temporarily occupied territories live on constant terror. Residents of our city were deprived of freedom of communication, of access of information. I give only one example. The filtration during all time now situated in our temporarily occupied city. Russian can stop all citizens anywhere and try to find something Ukrainian, flag, skirt or telephone. Especially on telephone they try to find some Ukrainian content. They think after 11 months of occupation, that all our citizens is the partisans. They finally started to get it. The occupiers also terror our children. From the kindergarten, they are told about the greatest of Russia. In school, they teach the program with propaganda of the aggressor state. Before the new year, the occupiers sent 2,600 20 children from temporary occupied territories to Moscow. They named it to New Year holidays. But in September 2022, children from Energodan and Kaminka Dniprovka also temporarily occupied it. And other territories from the Parisian region had such a rest, they were taken to Crimea, first of all for one week, then for two weeks, and only some part of these children bringing back after two and a half months. Parents are terrorized if their children continue to study online using Ukrainian program. Teenagers and students are calling for participation in a military organization. Part of the genocide is deportation of our people. A uh, purposeful police of Russian, which has been implemented for Dixcate in 1944, they deported the Crimean Tatars. In 2014, after the capture of Peninsula, the policy was continued. Now it is carried out in all captured territories. I will give a number of examples. 
Occupiers forcibly take residents of them to temporarily occupied territories out of the Zaporizhia region for their pro-Ukrainian position. And I can give only one example. So the occupied deported a woman who has not held, whom they held on captivity till one month beats and after it deported only but one thing. She doesn't know good Russian language. The civilized world must stop this. All Ukrainians deported and captured must be returned to Ukraine. Since the beginning of the war, the armed forces of Ukraine, greatest armed forces of Ukraine, have liberated more than 1,800 settlements. The same numbers remained occupied till now. I ask you to understand, it is not just our cities, homes or flats. It's our peoples remain captured, those who do not surrender, who do not obey and make resistance on the occupiers, people who despite everything try to not to lose, fight in the face fact that Ukraine will stand and win. And we have to do everything to justify their trust. Everything is done in order to free our people. Slava Ukraini! Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Now, we have a young man who went through a Russian filtration camp, Alexander Rachuk, who will be speaking to you together with Daria Kerasimchuk, who is an advisor and commissioner of the President of Ukraine on Children's Rights and Rehabilitation. In fact, what wounds you, would, uh, uh, what kills you, is not only bullets or Russian missiles. And even if your body is not injured by shells, every Ukrainian child has been injured and wounded by this war, traumatized. More than 7.5 million Ukrainian children who lived in our country before the uh, all-out war uh, uh, have uh, suffered. But there are those who we can uh, have as, uh, or should have as a, a separate group. These are children who were killed by the Russian Federation, who were uh, injured by the Russian Federation, those who were deprived of parental care because of this aggression. They were abducted, they were kidnapped and deported forcibly to either the Russian Federation or the Republic of Belarus. And we've got a, a unified information uh, portal of Ukraine, uh, children of Ukraine, and we, this horrible count, um, there are five, uh, 456 children who were killed. But while we were uh, listening to the speeches, we have learned that uh, another body of our child was uh, uh, recovered from the rubble in Dnipro. So we also uh, know about 897 children who were wounded. We've managed to identify um, the data of at least 13,899 children who were abducted and forcibly deported by uh, the Russian military. And unfortunately, we have only managed to bring back 125 children. 155 children is just a drop in the ocean, but each uh, number is about about the fate of a Ukrainian child like this young man. Such a wonderful and important soul. And I usually tell you stories of Ukrainian children who were abducted and then liberated. And now you can hear uh, the story of this uh, young man uh, firsthand, because he represents the future of uh, Ukraine, the new generation of our country. Uh, it is uh, Sasha. He's 12. And we've managed to bring him back to Ukraine, but he unfortunately has not yet been reunited with his family, with his mother, but I am hopeful that uh, this will happen soon. Uh, Sasha, I am uh, extremely proud uh, to know you, to be acquainted with you. Um, if you believe that you can uh, speak right now, uh, say so. If you believe that uh, you should stop here, we can stop here. Um, can you tell us uh, where uh, you were living when the war started? At the very beginning of the war, I was living with my mother mom, Snežana Kozlova, and my sister, Victoria, Sime uh, Victoria Kozlova. 
And on the 24th of uh, March, uh, I got under uh, the shelling and I was wounded close to my eye. What happened then? Then my mom and I uh, went to look for the Ukrainian military for them to take us to a factory. Uh, what factory? Uh, that is the um, iron uh, um, cell mills, right? Yes, uh, because uh, there were uh, Ukrainian military there and they had uh, the uh, first aid point where we could get medical assistance. Um, and then uh, the uh, Ukrainian military were running low on ammunition and uh, they were surrounded by the Russian troops. So they helped us uh, to get evacuated, but uh, the Russians captured us. Uh, they loaded us on the Kamaz uh, trucks and they took us to the Russian Federation. And that was the last, uh, in the ventilation camp, I saw my mom for the last time. Yes, they took me away and they didn't even allow me to say goodbye to her. I didn't know where they were taking me. They didn't tell me anything. They uh, later um, uh, told me that I would be taken to an orphanage and I would be adopted by a Russian family. Uh, but uh, and I told them that I've got my grandmother in Ukraine and I uh, want to go to live with her, but they wouldn't let me. And then they took me uh, to uh, the Oblast uh, Traumatology uh, Department in a local hospital and they provided some medical treatment to me. And I asked um, a, a guy from uh, that medical ward at, uh, for a telephone so I could connect to my mom, uh, sorry, grand granny, and I told her uh, where I was and she helped to uh, rescue me from uh, the Russian Federation. Is it true that uh, Russians told you that your mom doesn't want you, uh, uh, even though you saw her in the filtration uh, camp. Is it true that they said that uh, she would never come to fetch you? Yes, they did. Uh, they uh, told me that my mom didn't want me, uh, that uh, she was captured. She was, yeah, she was in captivity, she, uh, so she wasn't interested in me. Sasha, I would like to show you that we will do our best for your mom uh, to be able to hug you as soon as possible. Let me do that in her stead now. But we will do everything we can for every Ukrainian child uh, to uh, be brought back home to Ukraine. And we have to do that. It is incumbent on us to guarantee that. And I hope that within the next two to three days, we will uh, find uh, solutions in our dialogues, in our discussions uh, to bring those children back uh, to Ukraine. We've got Ludmila amongst us. This is um, Sasha's grandmother. I would like to thank you for um, uh, your responsiveness, for taking care of uh, your grand child uh, for staying strong and for going to uh, the Russian Federation to fetch uh, your uh, grandson and now you um, actually support him uh, while he's waiting for his mother to come back. Thank you very much. Sasha, you can join uh, the group. If I may also add that we uh, have got uh, a lot of work to do, huge work to do, and it is not only about finding every child and bringing uh, him or her back to Ukraine. But we should do our best to put an end to deportation and forcible replacement. And uh, it is, as I said, incumbent on us uh, to make sure that not a single child of Ukraine suffers from uh, this forcible uh, deportation. It is not to be. Thank you very much.